Hello, friends, and welcome to the Story Forge podcast, where we focus on the idea that making things matters. I'm Lyle Smith, your host, and I'm a writer, strategist, thinker, runner, father of a runner, husband of a gifted acupuncturist. I'm an author of a new book called Why Yellow Matters, available at Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and whyyellowmatters.com. And I made this podcast, which I think matters very much, and I hope matters very much to you. Uh, Today is Transformation Day with Dan Levens. Uh, Dan is a serial entrepreneur and a friend. Um, He's a serial entrepreneur in the sense that he started 11, uh, I'm sorry, 12 different businesses, but he has a common theme running through all of them, and uh, that is transformation. In his latest venture, Share One, uh, it's all about the idea that if each and every one of us could share one singular transformational story of ourselves, what a different world we would live in. We also, thanks to Dan, uh, dove pretty deep into the topic of AI and what we think AI is doing, what it might do and change, and how we are all going to have to adjust to a world with AI as a tool of creativity, communication, and power. Dan cornered me into thinking through some of my ideas on the topic, for which I'm grateful uh, and I hope you find valuable. I think it was a pretty awesome conversation that swung from acupuncture to business to even a little bit of philosophy. Uh, I hope you enjoy it, and here's my conversation with Dan. Um... So we're, I mean, you, you, the, the go, getting into uh, um, acupuncture and TCM was really interesting to me. I, I didn't know you were doing that. That's cool. So, but you say you grew up with it. Let's let's start there. Where where did you grow up? Where where did where does all that come from? Um, so where interesting. You come from? Yeah, interesting, interesting background. And I'll I'll actually go back a little bit further because I've always wanted to make like if I was a movie producer, if I knew somebody, I'd might I might think about making a movie out of this. So my dad is Belgian, and he was a Catholic priest, Jesuit, and he always like had this inkling to go to Asia. So he he was a photographer, so he, he started photographing and selling his prints as a priest and made enough money to get an airplane ticket to go to Taiwan to help the Jesuits set up a missionary in Taiwan. And my mom was one of his teachers, uh, teaching him Chinese, and they fell in love, and he renounced his priesthood. And moved back to Belgium and being fluent in Chinese, he easily became a diplomat for the Belgian government. And so he was stationed all over Southeast Asia. So I was born in Belgium, um, but I was raised in China, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Taiwan. Um, And before my parents retired, they they were both teaching at Johns Hopkins. My dad was teaching Buddhism, Taoism, and Asian thought. And my mom was teaching uh, Chinese uh, at Johns Hopkins. Wow. So yeah, it's a pretty it's a pretty wild, crazy love story, I guess, on on their side. But yeah, being raised in Southeast Asia, we always had a Chinese doctor around us. You know, TCM mm-hmm. was was huge. You know, reading the tongue and all that. Right. And I think the basic premise of it all that I that I still am and am, am in full agreement, and I think our system is broken, is the traditional way of looking at it is you 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 pay your doctor when you're well. And it's your doctor's fault for not keeping your, you in balance when you get sick. I love that. Right. And today in America, it's like the people that, that people are profiting off of you from being sick. And you're, yeah. you're relying like your well-being and your health on people that will profit if you're sick. That just doesn't make any sense. No, I, I would agree with you on that. It's, it's an interesting thing because it's, it's, I, I read at one point, because um, you get frustrated with all this stuff. You know, you have uh, – and I had – my son, Aiden, had uh, uh, the flu. He, he tested negative for flu, but it was all flu symptoms. So it was some version of the flu he had uh, in the last week and hit high fever for a week and a whole bit. And we'd gone to, um, you know, a new doctor and we're sort of navigating that and we're seeing what and I and I'm, and of course we changed from states. So our insurance changed. And now I'm and my reporting on my insurance is different than it was before my previous insurance. So I, I see what the insurance is paying compared to what I'm paying. And I'm like, how much do they get from the insurance company for one visit to see this doctor? I'm like, holy cow, this is incredible. Uh, 
And, you know, years ago I read a piece because uh, it was illegal for health insurance to be a for-profit business until 1973. It wasn't wow. until 1973 that it was made legal uh, for the insurance, the, the health insurance business to be a for-profit industry. And um, I, I don't know why. I don't know what law got passed. I don't know what effort was involved in that. Um, I'm sure there was a s- substantial lobbying effort. But it's it's. But that I think that if you could trace it back to one thing, the idea that your health is a for-profit industry is probably the biggest single problem of the whole matter right you know and and i know and i know you've worked with this for years with with different people um uh, on varying uh areas of that problem that that you know they're they're trying to treat they're trying to get their patients well as you say with the 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 idea that you you pay them when you're well and and it's their fault if it's if you're out of balance is really kind of fascinating to me yeah totally uh i think that's the way things should be and it's all about um, you know, if people spend as much time, money, and energy on dealing with sickness as they mm-hmm. do on staying well, they wouldn't be sick so much. Well, right. And so many industries in, in I won't focus just on America, but in the Western world are, are based on, you know, sort of selling bad habits. You know, everything from, you know, cigarettes and alcohol to, you know, mass-produced food is, is, is it's kind of, you know designed to get you to do more you know big sugar you know big whatever (laughs) (laughs) and that's i think it's a fundamental error in judgment and for a lot of people um so that's cool so how so you were you grew up all over the world really basically um yeah yeah um mostly so so your perspective your what i'm getting at is your perspective you know, like I grew up in New Jersey and lived in New Jersey most of my life. I've known people from all over the world, but I haven't lived there. Uh, so my, I have a, I have a, you know, as as world as as wide a worldview as I like to think I have. I I'm still kind of provincial. I'm not as provincial as some. I'm more provincial than others. Uh, but you grew up all around the world, so you know your 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 world your worldview has to be pretty wide, I would think. Anyway, do you think about that? Um, yeah, I do. As a, as a kid, I think, I think the, the, the bigger, the bigger lesson that I had was being half, half, right? So I'm half European, half Chinese and Mm -hmm. in Asia, they don't treat me as an Asian, even though I'm completely fluent, they treat me as a foreigner. Yeah. And then when I go to Belgium, even though I speak Dutch and French, um, they treat me like a foreigner. Like I right. walk into the bakery store and, and, and they look at me and say, what is this person doing here? And I open my mouth and I'm completely fluent and their jaws drop, right? right. So right. I've never really felt at home anywhere. Um, so the skill set that I learned was really to be able to adapt. Like you'll see me, if, I, if you throw me in a circle of, you know, whatever accent they're speaking, like within, within a minute or two, like I'll start speaking that accent as well just right. to try to right. integrate. And that's just part of who I am. Um, so what, what I've, what I've kind of seen, and it, what's interesting too, is, is English is my fourth language. Um, I have the skill set, but I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a startup guy. I've started 11 businesses. Um, I've never used any of my language skills in, in any monetization or any business whatsoever. Um, but what I, what I, what I do know is, is being able to put myself in other people's shoes to really recognize what's going on when, and to, to feel what's happening in the room um, and to be able to accommodate, right? So, and I think as a, as a business person, um, yeah, it's been really, really helpful to be able to, to um, you know, use, use that skill set and put myself in the shoes of others and look at the perspective of different things. And that's ultimately what marketing is, right? A lot of people's mistakes with marketing is like, well, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, you know, I can create this, I can have this. At the end of the day, what marketing really is, 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 you know, the perspective of your, of your prospects, right? So being, and you're a copywriter, you know that, you know that too. It's like, hey, it's not about what you're writing, it's about who's reading it and how do they immediately get that visceral connection to it? Like, what's the pain point that you can resonate in, right? Um, so being able to kind of adapt and see things from different angles 
right. um, I think has been a the, the, the really, really true gift. Which I think you have too, Lyle. <laughs> well, I think I think that's one of the one of the reasons we 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 kind of speak the same language in a yeah. lot of ways. Um, that way, because I there's a section in the book I write about where it's it's like I, I say I say it's always about them. It's always about it's not about you. It's about them all the time. I say it all the time. But there's a section in the book where um, I, I say you know when you when you when you study communications, like even at the earliest point in like grammar school where they talk about communicator either there's a communicator and there's a receiver and blah 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 and i said you know what you have something that you want to tell somebody else you want somebody you want to tell somebody this thing and in the end none of that matters what the only thing that matters is what they're willing to understand from you so if you're if you're trying to tell them you know, the sky's blue and they can only, you know, and they, and they come from a place where they live in the dark or work, work third shift. And all they see is darkness most of the time, you know, that's not what they're interested in. You know, you, they have something, you're trying to sell them something. You're not really trying to sell them something. You're trying to find what matters to them and connect it to what you do. And that's, and, and, and I think that's where most, uh, that's where most good copywriters are found <laughs> and where, where most weak copywriters and even, even, you know, strategic thinkers, founders, CEOs are, are get really, really focused on what they're doing compared to what their people they're talking to need. Yeah. You yeah, know? absolutely. So I'd love to, I'd love to talk to you um, about persuasion, right? So when it comes to copy, this is a hard one. <laughs> And marketing, right? So um, I've been a marketeer for for decades in different mm -hmm. forms and shapes, and helping startups and whatnot. And I've completely doubled down, as you know, on on share one right. uh, video testimonials. And and part of it is is the art of persuasion, right? right? Dr. Cialdini is like the godfather of influence, right? Right. And he he has he has this amazing quote of of the ninety five five. He said there are two types of people in the world, right? There are the initiators. Those are the people that are willing to try something new. They're out there learning. They're, they're absorbing. They don't care. Like they, they want to be the first person to do all these things. They're the initiators. Mm -hmm. And then the second type of people are the imitators, right? The imitators are the ones that won't do anything unless they hear from somebody else. They're waiting for mm -hmm. the initiators to give them it's like, you know, you go on Facebook, hey, anybody know a good Mexican restaurant, right? Right. They're, those are the people that are never going to try a new restaurant until they hear from their neighbors or friends. Right. And based on his studies, 95% of the population are imitators. Only 5% are initiators. So so putting my, my marketing hat on, it's like, you know, working with these doctors and, and these thought leaders, they're so good at teaching new things, at saying, hey, like, this is a new modality. This is all the, all these new things. And it's like, yes, that's great. But you're only targeting 5% of the population because right. you're only really the only people that you can influence to make a decision to purchase from you are these initiators, right? Right. right. The imitators are waiting for those initiators to report back saying, Hey, Dr. So-and-so or you know, this person, this service is great. Um, and, be and because of that, um, I've pretty much stopped providing all marketing services except for collecting video testimonials um, for businesses and thought leaders. This is fascinating because I, with the, I, I've, I've, I've learned something with the book, you know, cause I, I didn't know what was going to happen. You know, I, I thought I knew something about publishing and I thought, and I did, but not, you know, but now when you get out there and you're marketing it and you're trying to sell it, um, and you know, I'm, I'm doing two things with it. I'm trying to, I'm trying to sell the book a, and trying to use the book as a, um, a, a platform for, generating more business great yeah wonderful stuff but I, i've come to realize more than any industry i've ever worked in um reviews make a much make a bigger difference than anything else you know so when people when somebody else says um hey this is a great book read this that means way more than me telling you what the book's about how it maps to to what matters to you all that kind of all and all that stuff's important but it's like it it, it doesn't make a, a measurable difference compared to 
you know, other people. And they don't always have to be experts, you know, or, or well-known people who are writing reviews. It's, it's just they're writing reviews and, I, hey, I like this for this reason. You should read it, too. And the more of those you get out there, and and that's sort of the same thing. And, and I've noticed with with the video testimonial, the the stuff I've worked on with you in the past, seeing these things, they're they're compelling. You know, they're yeah. really compelling to hear people tell their own personal story of how this worked for them. And so, like like ninety 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 plus percent of all the books that we have in our house, and we have a lot of books in our house, mm-hmm. are all from hey, you know, you should read this. Right. Rarely, rarely. I mean, I do, but but rarely do I go on there saying, oh, this is a topic I want to research. It's usually a recommendation from somebody. Um, right. Yeah. So I guess I'm a, I'm an imitator. <laughs> well, I mean, but everybody, you have that, you have that, you know, in you. I mean, it's, you're, everybody's a little bit of both. And then yeah. there are people who are, you know, um, not everybody can be the inventor. Not everybody can be yeah. the Tesla or the Edison or the whatever. Um, you know, some people have to say, you know, I'll buy the, the, the next electric car yeah. for whatever reason, uh, because my friend had one and loved it. And, and, you know, it's good for the environment too. You know, that yeah. kind of thing. It's, they, they prioritize what's important for them. Um, so 11 businesses, let me talk about this. you I, 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 I put my, my working title was, uh, what did I say it was? Um, Something about being a serial killer. Serial, serial killer. Because <laughs> you say serial, because you say serial, serial entrepreneur is a phrase people throw around all the time. And I always I always laugh because I, I meet a lot of people who who uh you know and and it's 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 like a nickname. You don't get to give yourself a nickname. You know, other people have to give you that nickname and you have to earn it. And so, you know, they, they throw the term serial entrepreneur around and I realize they're just, you know, they don't know what they want to do. Some of these people, but then there are people like you who are, you know, actual card carrying serial entrepreneurs. And they, you, you, you're, every time I talk to you, you're always doing something interesting and unique. And, and there's a, there's sort of a running theme to what you're working on, uh, across the board. But, uh, like you say, you've, you've started 11 businesses uh, yeah, actually, uh, share one. Share one is officially the twelfth. Fantastic. So, uh, tell me about that journey. How did you? How did you go from? Because I come from a family of my dad worked in in corporate America, and uh, he was very good at that. And didn't. And and my mom was a school teacher, so I didn't have any entrepreneurial influence in my life growing up. Um, I guess it's a two part question. Do you have any? I mean, you, you talked about your parents' journey, which is unique and, and unusual, uh, in my experience. Um, how do you get into, into an entrepreneurial path? Um, so my parents are not, uh, entrepreneurial and then also being, being European, like even the word in French entrepreneur, right. Okay. Has a bad connotation to it. So it's, it's, if you translate a word for word, it's the person who takes in between. Okay. Um, so, so being an entrepreneur has always been like, like a little bit of a negative um, image of your your brokering deals. You're trying to make a little profit here, like yeah. like 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 that. And my parents are not entrepreneurs at all. Right. And I think what led me to to um, being an entrepreneur was. Um, not being fully accepted in any society, right. being quite the rebel as a kid. And then my MO has always been like, you know, wait till I get out of this house and I'll show you what I can do kind of a thing. Right. right. So as a very independent, even today, it's like if something wrong happens, I'm like, well, let me, let me show you what I can do by myself. Right. right. Um, so it's always been this, this solo, solo fight for me. Right. Um, and I think that's been a really big driving force, especially that once you've gotten your your beak wet in terms of oh, you know what, you can create a business and you can make money and you can you know do do the, do these types of things. Um, and the other thing too is is being able to recognize things that aren't working, right? Looking looking at the status quo and say like why why like like I had a, a yoga strap company. It's like you go to yoga. And they want to give you this flimsy little belt with a buckle on it. And they expect uh-huh. you to like be able to hang it around your foot and do all these things. I'm like, right. why? This doesn't, doesn't make any sense. So one right. of my companies was uh, Reach Loop, which we worked with with Anthony together. Oh, yeah. Um, 
and it, you know, it was, a, it was a great invention, right? So it's being able to recognize things that aren't working, um, and then being able to to you know have 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 it in you to start a business around it, right? Um, so that's been that's always been my 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 driving force. And a couple of businesses that I had back in Philadelphia were were like I started one of the first co working facilities in Philly before co working was really a mm-hmm. thing. Um, and then doing a lot of incubation and ran an accelerator for Delaware County for the government back then. Um, and my passion has always been like, like, Hey, like wake up, like, what's your gift? What's your purpose? Right. And let's figure out a way to, to monetize it. Like, don't, right. don't just, don't just, you know, clock in and clock out and, and do the nine to five and be depressed and have a mid age crisis. Like we all have a gift inside of us. And it was my, my deepest passion to like, to help people right. <laughs> recognize what that is and, and use my business skills to help them create a business around it. You know, not right. always successful. So, um, that's been my, that's been my, my absolute passion. And also, um, you know, working for other people can have its challenges. You know, you may right. not always agree with the way things are done or, um, you know, they may get desperate and do something that's not ethical or whatever that is. And, and you're, you're, you you become victim of that kind of culture as well. So, um, I'm unemployable. There's no way that I would ever work for anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> this is a hard thing. I, I've, I've noticed this too, because it's, it's every once in a while, Heather will talk about, well, you know, maybe I could just go work for some other, you know, medical clinic somewhere or the, you know, hospitals are using more and more acupuncture or whatever. And I'm, I just kind of laugh to myself because I'm like, you should, <laughs> just don't, I, she hasn't worked for another, she hasn't had a boss as long as I've known her. So you're looking at 20 years, 18 years. Um, so no, I don't think I don't think you're going to be happy doing that for one thing, and I, I think it's going to be a real challenge for you to do something like that. I think you're much more suited for, um, you know, creating your own path. Uh, and I've I've gotten there. I mean, I've been doing my own business now for 15 years, uh, marketing, writing, what have you, and um, I don't think I do very well in a. a corporate environment anymore either i mean i've been there i've done it i've done the agency thing uh and that's the reason i'm doing it now the way i do it now because i didn't like the way the agency thing was going so because i didn't think i I thought i felt it was predatory in a lot of ways it's it's like every time you turn around it's like oh well we can do that for you and then it's the, the nickel and dime the accounting and before you know it they're you know and i guess when you're working for you know massive multinational clients they don't pay that much attention to it. Uh, or maybe it's a, a badge of honor to pay more, um, which is always a weird thing to me, but okay. You know, I mean, and so I, I didn't like that. I didn't like that. Everything felt like you were, you know, uh, standing so close. Uh, you couldn't tell whose toes you were feeling inside your shoes, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and then having to write stuff that you may not agree with or clients that you don't really want to represent. Or in Heather's case, it's like, you know, now she's fighting a big battle, right? Yeah. It's like, well, acupuncture doesn't fit in here. If it's there and like insurance and all that other stuff, like I can't even imagine. Yeah. Well, she does. Uh, yeah. And she, she's been to uh, forest anyway, or, or made the decision to be basically a cash business. So she doesn't deal with yeah. insurance. She'll write insurance, uh, what they, what they call super bills, where it's like, here's what we did. Go take it to your insurance. If you can get reimbursed, good for you. But um, otherwise, you know, here's your bill and that's it. And that's, you know, and that's worked. That's worked well for her. She took insurance when we lived back in New Jersey and that worked well, but that's years ago. And it's it's yeah. a very different system now. And it's different state to state. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, which is a, which is another problem. So, uh, you know, you, you created... Um, you were talking about the co-working space, which I was, I, I met a lot of interesting people doing co-working because, because, you know, you, you, when you start out on your own, you're, you're looking for places, you don't, you can't afford an office, uh, you know, and I still work at home most of the time, but you know, I, I like the idea of, of meeting up with people in these co-working spaces. Um, 
and uh, and yours yours ended up being sort of as you said an incubator uh, uh, sort of mentality. So we, yeah, we did we did both under under the same roof, and um, yeah, co working regardless of how you do the math is it's hard it's hard to make it profitable. Yeah. And I remember when we work first op- opened in Philadelphia and went to visit it. I was like, this this, this doesn't make any sense. Yeah. It just like the amount of money they invested in the main staircase going up with like the bean bags and all that. I'm like, how many tenants do you need for how long? Right. Just pay for that. Like it just right. didn't make any sense. And now we know it was just, you know, investors after investors after investors. Right. Um, but it was cool because, you know, my 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 vision was um, hey, let's get all these startups and give them like an ease of entry into the world, give them right. an address and a receptionist and all that. And then being able to connect with each other, like give each other business. And then as a as a business consultant, then I could come in and, and choose the companies that I could help and work with. And there's an extra layer of, of, of income, right? Right. But I think strictly as co-working without anything else, right. uh, just doesn't really make any sense. And actually- Yeah, it's hard. That, yeah, the person that bought- uh, my co-working facility. It's changed hands twice now. One of them was an accountant and he saw, Hey, I can provide accounting service for, you know, hundreds of tenants. Right. Yeah. So that was big, huge deal flow for them. Right. Yeah. But, um, but Lyle, I want to, I've, I've been dying to have this conversation with you, um, about, uh, about AI. Right. So I'll be, oh, gosh. I'll, be I'll be completely, <laughs> I'll be completely honest and I hope you're okay with it and you feel free yeah. to cut it out. Um, so we, we used to rely on you, right? Yeah. We used to rely on you for every single client that came in to, to write copy. Um, and then AI happened. Yep. And then we were able to take some of our transcripts and throw back then it was Jasper. We could throw it into AI and crank out stuff that was, you know, kind of like good enough. Right. Right. Especially with copywriting. And, and to me, um, you know, part of part of our, our company culture was share one. Like we're trademarking the, the tagline now is is by humans for humans. Right. And what I'm seeing now is you know all these tools. Like anybody can crank out a hundred blogs in an hour and and overwhelm you know content out there. And I think content has been completely devaluated. Right. I see AI almost as um, the internet being born it's it's revolutionary but what it's what it's doing is like so in the old days it's like whoever had information mm-hmm. was king right? right and then the internet happened and everybody had information so that right. changed right right um and now it's like the the value of words the value of you know what you do right creating creating beautiful words are is 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 being devaluated because anybody can generate it so yeah I'd love to to hear your take on it um, in terms of how has how have you shifted and, and what's your you know maybe not now like there's especially with video right hey Jen and all these things aren't right. quite there yet but fast forward a year fast forward two years these engines are going to get smarter and smarter right um, where do you see all this going it's it's an interesting question and it's it's it was um, frustrating to me when when it all kind of started to break as a news story right so it, it's because i because i come originally from the news business <clears throat> and, and the news business you know what people like to say if it bleeds it leads and and uh i always like to say if it's you gotta you gotta remember you always have to remember when you're reading the news um the only reason it's in the paper is because it's unusual if it's not unusual it's not news if it's if everybody's doing it all day every day, it doesn't make the paper. Mm. So um, when the AI, we started talking about Chat GPT and all these other, and there's a million tools, and so I struggle with it because it's 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 I have an evolving opinion. Let's call it that. Um, I've used a few tools uh, to, to and and like good enough was the was the phrase you used that I think is really interesting because it's it's a lot of people are really like okay content. For a long time, if you go back to the earliest days, like people, if you, they would hide uh, text at the bottom of web pages that had yes. keywords in it that was the same color as the background, so you couldn't yeah. really see it unless you highlighted it. Um, and that, but that's going back a ways, you know. But it's it's kind of the same 
concept is when content, you're trying to fill the world with enough content to drive people to you. Now, does that content have, and this is a, a, a something I've, I've had to wrestle with with my clients for a long time, is does that content have to be really great to do that? No, it doesn't really. You know, and a lot of, t- a lot of times it doesn't. Um, but what it has to be is it has to be connected to the question the person was asking when they found that content. Right. So it's like, okay, it's not just about keywords. It's about the actual concepts and the understanding and what does it mean and all that kind of stuff. Um, So the better your content, the better that's going to perform. But then there's a point of diminishing returns. How much effort do you want to put into it to drive people to your site? And do people find, you know, and do people find your business by searching anyway? Or do people find you because somebody recommended them, for example? Um. Now I have used, uh, I had a couple of clients who were, who were just, they were like churning out content and whatever. And that's what we were doing. And I'm like, okay, so let me, let me look into this. Let me try some of these tools. And we tried some of the tools and it made it a lot faster to put out stuff, but you still had to go back and do an editorial pass, at least one to get it right and make sure it made sense because, you know, sure it dragged people to your site, but when they got there, does that answer the question they had? I don't know. So you have to go in and do that. So there's still an element of editorial quality that has to happen. Now, will that be replaced by AI someday? Maybe. Will AI, will AI get better over time? Undoubtedly. Um, will there always be a need for a human touch? I like to think so. Um, and then, the, and then the question is original thought, right? If you really think about how AI works, it's just basically collecting information, you know, millions. That's of already years. been used. That's already yep. been used. There's no mm-hmm. original thought. Mm-hmm. So the humans should still be responsible for original thought. But the cool thing that I saw the other day with Google was that, yes, because Google is also in the AI game. They're like, yes, you can use AI as a tool. But if they, they're they using uh, AI detection um, algorith- algorithms right now, and if they see a website that's using um, just content content spamming, they're calling it basically, yeah. just ge- generating blog after blog for SEO purposes, they will actually delist you. Yeah. So I, I was really happy to see that. <laughs> that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Because in the end, I mean, and there's there's a couple of lawsuits that are still out about it because because technically, I mean, in a lot of ways, uh, there's a strong argument to be made. Let me put it that way. There's a strong argument to be made that the AI tools, the way they're made now, are sort of a systematic copyright infringement. Um, mm. Is it? Is it not? I don't know. Courts are going to have to weigh in on this. And, and, and with any technology, and I think you'll agree with me on this, uh, the law is always a step and a half behind what technology is doing. Um, medical ethics is the same way. It's like, okay, what, here's what we can do, but should we? Um, so AI is kind of falls into that category. Now, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a threat to what I do, uh, in the larger scheme. I don't think it is because for example, like the book, for example, I wrote the book and the way I wrote the book, there's a lot of craft in the way it's put together. So it's, it's kind of written in a poetic format tone Mm -hmm. style uh short lines a lot of line breaks all that kind of stuff and out of curiosity i took a couple of my pieces and put them in and said you know rewrite this make this better whatever you know a couple of different approaches to it and i got it what they did to my stuff was like holy cow i can't believe this is so terrible (laughs) um (laughs) it doesn't it it doesn't say it doesn't mean the same thing at all right um because it's it's so it's so specifically formatted that it it doesn't make sense to the AI, right? So they have to kind of interpret it into something that makes sense to the AI. Now, um, is that good? Is that bad? Does that mean mine is, you know, it's non traditional? I'll tell you that. Um, but I think that's what makes mine interesting to the people who are reading it. Now. Um, over time, will more of this kind of stuff get out there and, you know, will I be able to type, write, you know, a piece on a piece on, uh, editorial on, uh, the pros of AI technology and writing 
in the style of Lyle Smith. And right. maybe, maybe it'll get it. Maybe it won't. Maybe it'll get it close. You know, I think, I think getting it close is really what you're going to end up with in the long term. And then there's a point where you have to decide, uh, is it good enough? As you say, it's, you know, and I, I don't, I, I don't know where it's, they, they are going to get better, but the weakness is always going to be, it's only based on what's available for Already it to written. take in. Right. Yeah. Um, so if you're trying to do something that nobody's done before, um, I think that's important. I think a lot of inventors think that's the, the, the 5% you're talking about. They think that's all important. The 95%, maybe they don't care so much. Yeah. And I think that's, that, I think that's kind of the weakness in humanity in a lot of ways. <laughs> you know, it's kind of how politics works. It's kind of how, um, you know, uh, uh, tabloid journalism works. It's kind of how, you know, cause you're, you're, how do I put something out that's going to appeal to a wide number of people, a wider number of people. Uh, and maybe it's not as good, you know, it's like the old argument about Apple versus, uh, Microsoft, right. Uh, or Apple versus PC PCs were everywhere. Cause they were, they were a cheaper upfront investment. Uh, Apple's, um, I'm going to show my, my, myself a little bit here and say apples are better machines you know um but they were a lot more expensive for corporations is that true anymore i don't know you know you got to make your choices yeah. but uh but that was that was how the the market was for a long time everybody was everybody at least in the creative world everybody was using all the corporations were using pcs and all the creatives were complaining because they didn't have the max to use right or they had to go use a different system within the corporation. And that was a whole different level of complaint from, you know, finance. So, you know, I don't know. I don't know what the, I don't know what the answer is. I think the biggest thing is for me, and I think it probably is, is this with everything is, is you have the, the people who are able to adapt and evolve with what's going on around them are the ones who are going to do the best. Yeah. So, so I'm diving a little bit deep, deeper into this guy. Um, I read a news article a few days ago. Um, there's a famous philosopher, Daniel Dennett. I've yeah, never heard of him. You heard of him? I, this, this, I, I don't. I can't put my finger on it, but yeah. I, heard, I heard his name the other day, and I'm like, wait, what is this guy? He, yeah, he just he just passed away in April, but he did an interview with the BBC, and they were talking about AI, and he had an interesting interesting perspective. He he said. Um, and, and hopefully I'm getting this right, but, but humans, right? The human brain in isolation will not learn anything, right? So the human brain yeah. is always looking at other experiences or is, is always absorbing things, right? Mm -hmm. So what AI is doing right now is potentially like existential to civilization, right? When you, when you can't trust the number one way that you're feeding and growing yourself Right. And when, when you're being fed things that are, that are potentially fake, then you, you become, to, you start questioning, like, I don't, I don't know what, it, basically he's like, it's a crisis, right? Right. right. Um, and, and so, um, and part of, part of Share One's vision, my, the video testimonial is like, we, we eventually, you know, with the tagline, you know, buy humans for humans. is right. like, when you see a Share One video, there's a, there's a, there's a certificate of authenticity that this is conducted by a human, Right. Right. For a human representing a true experience, right. and I feel like you know, fast forward a year, two years, three years, when you can just type in a prompt and a video gets created, or even today, like the the, the Indian Prime Minister Modi uh, for the elections this year, he basically took his speech and used AI to create like all the dialect versions of his speech oh, wow. and put it out all over India, so yeah. that the local. Um, tribes or local local communities. Oh, this guy speaks our language, but he doesn't. Right, you know all the right. deep fake stuff and all that. It's like, right. wow, like what is the world coming to? And I think at some point, um, humans are going to have this tremendous yearning for something real. Yeah, no, what's I think you're right real, on that. Yeah, what's that real, real connection? And I'm I'm really hoping that, and that, and I'm sure technology will come. Like you know, with SSL certificates and you know signatures of authenticity, whatever. Sure. Um, you know, we're, we're hoping to be in the forefront of things with, with video, right. With our video testimonials. Um, but I'm hoping that there will be something for copy as well. I mean, there are, well, I think, I think that's right. And you, it's going to be, um, 
somebody posted on on my feed the other day. There, the, it's a it was for a, a legal class or a lawyer friend, a friend of a, a lawyer friend of a lawyer friend posted this thing. And and for their class, they were he went into AI and had them cre- uh, recreate uh, photographs, famous photographs. Um, you know. What are the what are the instructions you would need for someone someone to take this famous photograph and, and create it into a painting? And so they took the famous one of the Afghan girl with the with the with the striking green eyes, you know, the famous yes, yes. one. Yeah. And then National Geographic. Yeah, that's the one. And and another one of uh, the famous news photo of the uh, Hindenburg uh, blown up. And they created them, and they were pretty, you know, good enough. They were pretty good, right? But you look at it, and if you, if you took a little time and compared and look at them and look, just look at the paintings that AI created for these things, so-called paintings. Um, the image of the girl was not the best description anybody had in all the comments was like, it's just, it's, it, it, there's no humanity. There's yeah. nothing, you know, you can't yeah. get that. So the eyes aren't quite there. The skin tone is not quite there. The even the texture of her garments was not quite there, and it's like it's, there's something that's not. You, you look at it, and it's not quite right. It's it's close, but it's not quite right. And the uh, the Hindenburg one, I, I I said, God, it looks like a. Uh, it, it's cool. It looks great. It doesn't look like the photo. It looks like an album cover, you know, and um, and that's what it was. It looked like it was a photo that had been doctored, and so, you know, I mean. Uh, sooner or later, and I like, uh, I'll use, I don't know if you listen to Mark Maron's podcast, um, but I try and, I, I, I use him as sort of, uh, not sort of, call it inspiration for what I do here in, in, in style. Because I wanted, I rather, I would rather have a conversation than an interview, you know? And um, his, his podcast is really, really popular, I think, because it's one human talking to another. It's not... Like here, let's just talk about your business. Let's just talk about this. Let's talk. Let's talk about everything and how it all impacts everything else. And that's harder for. It's harder to feel authentic if it's generated by, you know, digitally generated. Yeah, and then and I think you you mentioned the 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 legal aspect of things, right? Um, it's like you know the way we treat counterfeit money. Yeah. You know, if we had the same approach for counterfeit content or counterfeit videos, mm-hmm. I think we'd, we might be might be on the right track. I don't know. It's 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 hard. It's a difficult conversation. It's because it's a powerful tool. Well, it's it is a powerful tool, and it's useful even to people like me who who uh, a lot of people in my industry, or my area, uh, are threatened by it. And I'm like, well, if I'm going to, sp- I don't want to waste a lot of time being threatened by it. I want to figure out how to exist with it. And, um, you know, and that's the thing I, you know, I, uh, you know, ironically, I wrote a, uh, there's a piece in the book that's, that's, it's not about AI. It mentions AI and it talks about AI a little bit. And I, and I, I did that on purpose because I'm like, it's already out of date. <laughs> <laughs> My opinion has changed already. So, you know, and it's going to change over time. So it's like, is it's our evolutionary, what, what's, is it? What is it? Boyle's law: the technology changes every eighteen months, uh, or doubles every. Uh, computing power doubles every eighteen months. Um, it, it's like you have to be able to adapt to all this change, and if you can't, you're going to be in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. So absolutely, absolutely. You know. Anyway, so tell me, tell me about because uh, we we talked a little about a couple of your businesses. I love proof, by the way, because uh, I just the way the way, and I I I, I kind of see proof as a like a direct line to what you're doing now is this video testimonial thing because proof was really people sort of telling their own story and what's passionate about their lives and and that kind of stuff and then you get into the share one stuff which is more uh you know testimonial-ish but it's the same kind of you know okay tell me what you think tell me what you believe and i i find that really powerful um yeah, so so thank you for bringing that up. Witness Approved. Um, the website's still up, witnessapproved.com. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was a, a project that came out of a six month long transformational leadership program that I was in. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's where I met my wife. 
Um, but the idea was you have TED Talks, right? There's the idea right. we're sharing. And then I'm running this 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 um, incubator. I'm running this co-working facility. And there are all these these amazing human beings with these ideas. Right. And and I'm like, you know, if everybody knew the person behind the idea and what like got them to do what they're doing, that there will be this immediate like visceral connection to these people. And that's right. that's perfect marketing. So right. I was like, okay. So instead of the idea we're sharing, let's create something where it's like the people we're sharing. And that's mm-hmm. where the proof came in is I would work with these entrepreneurs and and basically drill down, drill down, drill down into exactly why they do what they do. What was a childhood event or childhood trauma or something that happened in their lives that led them to give up everything? I've met people that have given up their entire trust funds and, you know, investments and everything just to, to pursue this idea. Mm-hmm. Some of them lost it all, right? Mm-hmm. What does it take to do that? So what we did was we, we basically crafted like a three to seven minute story on proclaiming your why. And then right. we, we, we built a stage and there's yeah. live audiences and um, they would memorize the speech and they would stand in front of the audience and, and tell, share their why. And we had video cameras mm-hmm. and recorded the whole thing. And they weren't allowed to talk about what they do. It right. was about design. And then after they, they did their proof talk, um, I would get on stage and interview them and, and, and bridge the connection between their story versus what they do. Right. It was super, super powerful. Um, and then COVID hit, right? Yeah. So, so we sold like that entire studio and we started doing virtual, virtual recordings. And finally, as a marketeer, I'm like, you know, what's the one thing that's really, really going to help people move the needle, right? A proof talk is great if you watch it, but at the end of the day, as a, as a consumer, they're not looking to find out, well, what, well, what does the CEO of this company truly believe in? Why do they do what they do? It's nice, right. but it's not the, mo- the biggest needle mover. So, um, that's where we, we, we basically said, Hey, let's just create something a lot more affordable, virtual recordings and just capture people's experiences of a transformation. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it, it is an evolve, sure. continually evolving thing. <laughs> well, that's it. I mean, it's, it's, it's why you see what, what has the, what has the impact, right? What yeah. is the, what is the thing that's going to, it's, it's about connecting in the end. Uh, you know, it's like you, why do you buy, you know, I mean the, the old, questions you know why why do people buy coke instead of pepsi why do people go to mcdonald's instead of burger king why, there's no there, well yeah i mean <laughs> these are bad examples but the uh, mass produced crap okay try uh why do people <laughs> go to whole foods instead of sprouts there you go okay you know um it, it, it they they feel a connection to it in some way or another it's not just because it's closer it's not just because it's cheaper you know people people pay more more for things all the time just because they feel connected to it. Um, and more and more so now, a lot of research has been put in about uh, loyalty and then also um, people are willing to pay more for the right reasons, right? The right culture. Uh, well, and that's, that's, that's more and more important. And that's even grown. I mean, that's even yeah. become more, more uh, fundamental to the way people shop. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I see people, you know, and then you look at Whole Foods. I remember because we used to, sh- it was funny because we shopped at Whole Foods a lot when I was in New Jersey. And then we moved to Florida and there was no Whole Foods near us. Uh, and then we came back here and I went to the Whole Foods here. And I hadn't really been shopping at Whole Foods a lot since um, since the Amazon connection, takeover. <laughs> I don't know how you, how, do you, how you describe that. Purchase. Uh, and the experience is very different than I yeah. remember. You know, and uh, better work. Did you work. double your rates after you walked into Whole Foods? <laughs> we, used to still, we used to call it a whole paycheck. <laughs> but you know, and I go, you know, I go to different places for different things too. So it's, and but then you have to decide. People decide, okay, how much is it? Is it worth driving cross town to Costco because I know the fancy champagne I like is significantly less expensive there than it is three miles from my door i sometimes i do sometimes i don't i don't know and and you know but that's the beauty of it that's that's part of it's another thing i wrote about in the book it's like it's like uh, people are you know as as rational as we want them to be people are irrational they make decisions for reasons we can't always predict um we just have to kind of understand that as best we can and and again if you can connect to it yeah it's 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 huge 
um, you know, I found myself really being caught so much in, in, in that philosophical state, right. Of what we, what we believe or what I believed was right. Right. Um, and at the end of the day, it was like, um, you know, what, what do consumers need today? And like, what's the, what's the most easiest, lowest hanging fruit? What are people really, really want? You know, at the end right. of the day, they want to know it's, it's the whole, um, the imitators, right. Being able to satisfy the imitators. Right. And I think the wise addresses a lot for the initiators. Yeah. Um, and then if you kind of do the math about the five and the 95, you know, so I'm, I'm kind of shift, get, shifted gears a little bit. In the last few no, years. it's true, but it's, but the why I think, but the, but people, if you can, it's, it's like the Steve jobs quote about, you know, don't, um, don't listen, don't, don't let your customers tell you what they want. You tell your customers what they want. And that's kind of it. And if you can answer the why for them and make it clear what it is, that's talking to the 95%. You know, it's the, the, the 5% want to take the time to figure out why. And um, the 95% kind of, they just want to know that there is one, you know? Yeah. Or better yet, <laughs> you know, your neighbor is going down the road in this new Model T instead of a horse. Right. Whoa, this thing's faster. Okay, I want one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if if I was yeah, if, if people if 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 I asked people what they wanted, they would have told me a faster horse. I had that quote. That's on a great the, quote on the wall, of the conference room in a co-working facility. <laughs> it's great, but it's true. I mean, it's like you know, if you don't know it exists, you know, uh, there's a comic who did a whole bit about uh, having internet on the airplane, and it was the first time he'd taken a plane that had internet on it. And the guy was sitting next to him, and they got they they started taking off, and the flight attendant got on the on the uh, PA and said, uh, "Oh, we're very sorry, but you know we're still working out some of the kinks on it. the The internet is not working on the airplane for this flight. I'm sorry." And this guy's, "Oh, son of a bitch! Nothing works ever more." It's like you didn't even know you, this existed five minutes ago, <laughs> and now you're pissed off that it's not working. <laughs> So yeah, I mean it's all it's perspective, right? Totally. So yeah. yeah. So tell me, I got two 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 things I want to ask you. I want to give you an opportunity. Was it, tell me about Share One because because you're you're kind of putting uh, a lot of effort into Share One. So tell me what the like what does it what does it feel like to be involved with Share One? Um, so the vision for Share One is really um, internally, like I see it as as a new commodity for truth. Um, I think, you know, and, you know, based on our conversation today too, it's like in light of everything that's happening with AI and, and people mistrusting things, Amazon today employs 12,000 full-time employees just to track down fake reviews, right? So the written oh, wow. word, written reviews, all those things, nobody trusts them anymore. Yeah. We've got this amazing research graph on how little people trust Yelp, Google reviews, even those things right. that are trying to be super authentic or authenticated. Right. Um, so to me, it's there, like, is, there is a de- there is a delay for for Amazon reviews to get posted. I, I I've, I've learned. <laughs> Can you imagine twelve thousand full time employees and their sole responsibility is to track down fake reviews? It's crazy. That's, that's absolutely crazy. That's crazy. Um, but that's the world that we live in, yeah. right? Um, so so share one is is you know I want people to know every time you see a share one video and I'm, I quite haven't figured out so this is this is one of my favorite quotes this year Lyle I think you'll 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 enjoy it um, so a um, Mary Morrissey I I love Mary Morrissey she's amazing and one of her things was if you know how it's a goal if you don't know how it's a dream. Oh. Right. So her big thing is all is about, you know, creating the biggest dream and her events right. like the dream builders. And, and so I've always been very focused on, on how it's like, well, how, okay, we can do this, we can do that. So, right. so the dream, <laughs> which I don't know how is to make these, to have this ability for consumers and people and human beings to be able to share their true experiences for others to see. Right. And the reason the company is called Share One initially was if every single human being were given the opportunity to share one transformational experience and make that accessible to others, I think we'd live in a very different world. So, so being able to to um, 
not be censored, right? Even when you're talking about healing modalities and, and allopathic versus acupuncture or any of these things, if anybody has gone through a true experience that's transformational, um, being able to share that with the rest of the world in some right. way and making it, I mean, of course, you know, we need to make money and it costs money to edit and produce all these things. But is there some kind of a, a way to verify uh, human experiences that are, that are certified to be authentic? All right. So that's that's my 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 big vision for for share one. I love that. It's it's um you know and here's the, the naive person in me. Um you talk about people don't trust Yelp reviews and whatever and I and I kind of get why because it's a lot of times it's just like oh this place is terrible blah 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 or this place is great blah 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 and there's no, there's no there's no there there, right? But when you talk about sharing an authentic uh, transformational experience. So we were talking about somebody who's actually, um, you know, telling one of the stories of their life. Um, and this, maybe this is what share one does is, is you're, you you capture something that just sounds so authentic. You can't deny it, you know? And so there's, there's the, you know, Amazon says this is a verified review because somebody actually bought it from Amazon. And then there's the, that story made me cry or that story made my heart beat a little faster or whatever. Um, and that's, that's, a, you know, cause I ask, I, I like to ask a lot of, you know, when I do the, the brand story work that I do with people is I always, you know, and they, they always feel a little less so now, but when I first started doing it, they always felt a little off put by the idea I'd ask feeling questions, you know, what does it make? What is it? What is your product or service? How do they feel after they've engaged with you? How do they feel um, when you've solved their problem? How do they feel when they come to you with a problem? Are they frustrated? Are they sad? Are they ready to give up? Are they, you know, are they ready to take on the challenge and move past it? Whatever. How do they feel? And that's a very, but when you get in video in video, you can get that more than you can, um, you can get it a little bit in audio when, when you're doing podcasts. I see some people respond to things like that sometimes, but you know, when you're writing it, it's, it's, it's up to the, the receiver's brain to translate that into what it feels like. Uh, but in video, you can see how somebody feels about it. And that's really kind of interesting. And that's one of the things that we look at, right? So when we do record video testimonials, so many people spend, um, so much time on the how. Right. Yeah. So how much, how often, how different, how much better. Mm -hmm. But people have to realize that that what what allows a human being to make a decision to purchase is the outcome. Right. It's a transformation. So right. once you once you feel the transformation, once you feel, hey, who am I gonna be um when I'm done with this? Like right. once I've, once I'm done consuming this. And if you can allow your consumers to have that feeling first and then right. go into the house, right. then they're going to start making their own mind say, okay, this is how I'm going to feel. And this is how it's going to happen. It's almost like they're making their own decision. Right. Um, so, so, and that's the beauty of video testimonials, the same thing. It's like, you know, we, we, we try and capture um, the, the emotion, the transformation of um, what it feels like to have that service. And then you yeah. can talk about the details of things. Right. Yeah. Right. That's cool. Yeah. That's really cool. Well, our time's up. Okay. <laughs> Ish. I could go on for a long time. I love talking to you, Dan. Uh, I, I appreciate your time and uh, I, I look forward to see what you're doing. Because every time I talk to you, you're doing something really interesting so it's it's always fun to talk to you so thank you for being thank you to, for taking your time oh my god absolute pleasure Lyle. you and i go back many many years <laughs> it's been a long time <laughs> we've seen each other in very different renditions for sure <laughs> yeah no it's all good it's all good all right well uh thank you for having take me care. Yep. take care of yourself i want to tell you about something new my new book yes i wrote a book it's called Why Yellow Matters. It's about communicating, writing, deciding, understanding. It's for people who write for business or market or sell things, which, face it, is all of us at one time or another. It's for writers or people who hire writers. It's for creators or creative professionals or people who need things created. Thinking things, deciding things, writing things. 
It is about brevity and balance, cleverness and chaos and clarity, the hard things and the great things, and opening yourself up to the zone to make things. But most simply, it's about taking the time to ask why, and 30 other thoughts to make your things matter more. Why Yellow Matters is on sale now, and readers are loving it, and I hope you will too. Get it on Amazon or Barnes & Noble, or if you order directly from the Nimblesmith website, we'll include a special little gift just for you. Pick up your copy of Why Yellow Matters today. If you find yourself enjoying the StoryForge podcast and embracing the idea that making things matters, give us a review at Apple Podcasts or wherever it is you listen to these things. It helps others find the show and hopefully enjoy it as much as you do. Uh, the Story Forge is presented by Nimblesmith, the content marketing agency. That's Nimblesmith, spelled with a Y, dot com. All recording, editing, interviewing, scheduling, and executive producing tasks are handled by yours truly, your host. This podcast would not be possible without the sincerely excellent help of our friend and producer, Anthony Sergi of Dynamic Art in Motion, who makes a number of other fantastic podcasts that matter, including a guest in the house about all things hip hop. The Career Chat Room, hosted by HR Pro Aaron Sergi, and a bunch of others. Music for the program is from the Jody Nardone Trio Lights Will Guide You Home album. If you like the work we're doing, please share the StoryForge link far and wide and tell all your friends about us. And you can always send us questions or suggestions through the Tell Us Your Story link on the website. Or support us on our new Patreon site. You can learn more at patreon.com slash makingthingsmatters. Or just shop our store on the website at thestoryforge.com. That's the-story-forge.com and click the shop link at the top of the page. Thank you for listening. 